This show was previously recorded live in Kansas City with Kansas City Limits. Welcome to Kansas City Limits. We are dedicated to providing a platform for local musicians, bands, and entertainers to showcase their original talents. Major support for this program is brought to you by Kansas City RV. Show me adventure. RV. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Kansas City Limits with Jeff Porter tonight. And Bob Walkenhorst. <laughs> so I was asked to interview Jeff for this show and, and uh, program tonight. And my first reaction when they asked me was, well, you better run this by Jeff because he may not think I'm the guy to do it. They asked Jeff if, I, if he would be okay with Bob interviewing him. And Jeff said, you better run that by Bob because he may not want to do it. So. <laughs> I think we were both a little bit, well, maybe not. I don't know. I thought for certain you would say no. Oh, well, no. Yeah. I thought, that, well, no, why not? Well, and when I said it, I found out that you had already, they had already asked you. Oh, okay. So, okay. Yeah. But uh, the, the challenge tonight is going to be keeping it to 20 minutes because Jeff and I can go on. And uh, one time when we were in Norway, we were part of this kind of three-day event, and they wanted Jeff and I to talk about uh, songwriting for a little audience. And so we started talking about songwriting, and at 90 minutes, they had to cut us off. <laughs> Guys, we got to go home. Yeah, that's right. that was great. <laughs> you got to hold your mic up. Oh, that's there right. That go. was great. <laughs> <laughs> Have you never used a microphone I before? Have. I have. Holding one is odd. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I know. Um, so anyway, I, I tried to figure out, okay, how, do I, how are we going to keep this to 20 minutes? And uh, what do I want to ask Jeff that I don't already know? Yeah. And uh, so, the, so it became kind of a challenge kind of narrowing it down. So Jeff, I kind of looked at your musical life and your life, which I, I have a lot of insight into both. Absolutely, you do. And I wanted to kind of put it into a timeline but not just a timeline of who's your influences, what was the name of your first band, not that kind of stuff, but something a little more, uh, something that kind of ties it together between the music you play and the person you are. So, uh, go, so I looked at your life as different acts, you know, act one, act two, act three. Okay. And even though you and I have known each other for 20 years now, and played music together for 20 years. Yeah, we've been playing uh, together for, for 20 years. We've yeah. actually known each other casually. But we've really only known really, each other really, during the time we've been playing 2000, music. 2002, you called me. Was it? I believe Because 2003, so. when we really started playing. Yeah, when, yeah. When, when was um, the beginner released? 2003. Okay, well that... Yeah, so okay. 20 years. There we go. Wow. See, this is why it's going to take a long time, folks, wow. because... <laughs> it was two years? Was it three? But, um, yeah, so I've known you for 20 years, but I really only got to know you in Act 2. There was Act 1. And so without going back to the cradle, I just want to go back to your, some of your earliest memories of music and when you knew that for you music was something more than what you were just going to listen to. You had this urge to be more than a listener of music. You needed to play the stuff. Do you remember that, that crossover point for you? I absolutely do. Um, it was in um, a buddy of mine, Fred Berry, um, whose name you've heard me mention before. Fred Berry's dad, by the way, um, started custom electronics with Buddy Ross. And uh, Fred Berry, Fred, they weren't junior and senior, but the elder Berry, as we called him, um, invented the custom handheld radar that we all love so much that the, the cops have. You know, that was, H, it was called the HR-12, handheld radar. Um, and this and is why this is going to take a yeah. long time, folks. <laughs> and anyway, and, and I remember being in, in, in Fred's bedroom, and he had a reel-to-reel, -reel, I'd, I'd been listening to records, and he had a reel-to-reel -reel, um, tape deck, a quarter track or whatever, or, or four track. And, you know, it, now it's legal. We were smoking a lot of pot. And, and, and he put on a track of, I'm not even sure what it was, but it was just the timbre and the actual sound of this acoustic guitar that he'd recorded with reverb and delay. And it was just like you could climb into it. And I was like, and it was the coolest thing in the world to me. And I just wanted to climb inside of the sound of it. And I thought, I'm hooked. And then at about that same time, this is when I was maybe 14, um, Fred was doing sound for a band called The Rhythm Function that went on to become Pat's Blue Rhythm Band, that went on to become Blue Rhythm reggae band that was, um, you know, a wonderful, some of my heroes. And Fred was doing live sound, and at about 15, we went down to Off the Wall Hall in Lawrence, 
and the band is playing, and I saw college women dancing. And I was like, I don't know what this stuff is, but count me in. <laughs> well, so that's a good segue into kind of, kind of the next thing I want to ask you about. Not the women, but, uh, but genre, genres of music. Because I know that, um, like, most, like most people who start out uh, realizing they want to play music, and maybe they want to create music, some of your early uh, heroes in songwriting were John Prine and Chris Christopherson. Absolutely. The first band I ever saw you play in was actually a country band, Kitty West. Wow, you you I saw, saw Kitty I West. I saw Kitty West wow. with the Lone Star. So yeah, I actually saw you play. Wow. And so Jeff was playing. I you know, wish I folk, had those shirts. Folk and country, um, which was is a normal route. So when you're you know a white guy in the the Midwest, that's kind of like well, yeah, that's kind of the yeah. normal roots. But the thing that's unique about your musical journey is that you have crossed a lot of genres. You have. Uh, you have experimented, not just experimented, you've immersed yourself in a lot of different kinds of music. So um, jumping ahead then, after your, rather, rather than going through all the boring stuff of here's all the crappy bands I was right, in. Right, yeah. You know, there, like, there were many. But yeah, for all of us there yeah, are. You've got to make a whole lot of bad music before you can learn how to make you good gotta music. You've got to play with a lot of frogs before you play with a handsome prince. There you go, man. Or whatever, <laughs> whatever the analogy is there. And who's that handsome prince? Hey, hey, hey. Um, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Sailor. So, um, so you mentioned Pat's Blue Rhythm Band, Pat's Blue Rhythm, which yeah. became Blue, Blue Rhythm, Rhythm, which, yeah. you know, it was a legendary reggae respected band from Kansas City yeah. or from Lawrence, you know, yeah. from the Midwest. Nom nominated for a Grammy. And you were kind of a protege. Is that, is that a fair way to say yeah, it? Yeah, I was the kid in the, in the um, yeah, absolutely, very well set up. Okay. I was the kid back in the soundboard and at, at the rehearsals in the, in the corner. And so th you eventually then had your own reggae band, The Zoo. <laughs> and, uh, and I want to ask you about okay, how do you jump, from, jump genres like that from folk and country, and now the next thing I'm going to do is reggae. Well, you know, believe it or not, country and reggae are a whole lot alike. They're both really simple. They're both just a couple of chords. Um, they're just kind of convoluted. You know, reggae is, is, is played different. And like I said, when I saw um, Rhythm Function playing in Lawrence, I was like, I want in on this. And I just, I found it. Um, interestingly enough, after, well, I was playing 20 years of playing reggae music and then all sorts of other world music, soca, and Sukus and stuff with um, Blue Rhythm, SDI was the name we went by back then. In the back of my head, I remember thinking, I, I should just blow all this off and just start writing country songs um, eventually. So, and eventually you did. And eventually <laughs> I did. It took a while. So, but. And how it took that turn, it was just something I, I fell in love with. Um, I still do, especially um, for those of you that want to hear the <laughs> evolution of reggae music. It was first, it was ska music. Jamaican music was ska music. It was just comes directly from um, American jump blues. Um, and then there was this wonderful type of music called Rock Steady, which is from about, about 1964, Rock Steady started happening. And it went up to about 1967 until we got, you know, um, Haile Selassie, um, Rasta, stuff like that, where it became reggae. And I and I going beat down Babylon. And they're, they're all very different rhythms if you listen close enough. A lot of people think, oh, I just sound like reggae. It's just the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're very, very different. Rocksteady being all taken from most of it redone American rhythm and blues love songs. And I am proud to say our son Brock is a huge fan of Rocksteady music. And I'm like, hey, man, who did this track? And he goes, oh, well, that was Desmond Decker back in, you know, blah, 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 blah. So he knows all about it, too. So that's how I still love reggae music, and if I'm listening to something while I'm cooking, it's probably going to be rock steady. So this will bring me into my first uncomfortable question. Okay. Really, the only <laughs> uncomfortable well, question, it is because it's something that has intrigued me for a long time. Okay. So that at the time that you started playing reggae music seriously, um, the the police were happening, mm -hmm. and you know their early records are, have very much a, a strong reggae influence. Very much. Paul Simon is deeply into South African music. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these you know, white guys are, um, are immersing themselves in a, a music from another culture. When do you hit a point where you feel like, I am doing this music justice? When, how, do you, how do you evaluate your role in that music? I was feeling really good with that um, once I started playing with the guys in Blue Rhythm and really understood the rhythm of it. And it's, that's a really good question because there came a point 
um, where I felt very uncomfortable doing it because I realized I was just this white dude from Overland Park. Um, when we got into, um, there's a type of uh, Trinidadian music called soca, um, which is an anagram of soul calypso, and it's really fast. A lot of people think of it as calypso. And they're talking about carnival and, and whining and grinding and stuff. And I, was, I told the guys, man, I said, man, I can't, just can't sing this stuff anymore. Man, I just, I, I have nothing in common with this. And that was really around the time I thought, I need to just start going to write in country songs. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that that's, you know, I think for a particular, you know, you were, what, in your early 20s and you're playing this music and you're experimenting, trying to find about what, yeah. what is it that really speaks to me. Uh, so the band The Zoo, if any of you were lucky enough to see, to see The Zoo, how many pieces, pieces in The Zoo? Oh, it was seven, eight, seven, seven or eight on stage eight. and then three. Big, oh. big band when I had a three piece. <laughs> I got something to say about that. No, no, no. This, this <laughs> no, is my, no, this no, is no. my interview. No. Man. Well, this you is wait, your interview. You wait. You, okay. okay, you wait. But... Uh, uh, I got to see the zoo many times, and they were charismatic and tight, you know, musically tight, yeah, and, good, and good. you know, you couldn't take your eyes off of them. So we're gonna we're gonna quickly move past the zoo, but not before we talk about being on Star Search. Yeah, baby, the original Star Search. When Ed, it meant Ed something. Mc, Ed McMahon when it meant something. <laughs> like back when, um, you know, uh, who was it? Uh, Sinbad was on it, and who was the country band that became Sawyer Brown. Sawyer Brown became? They won it the year before we lost it. Um, and it was fun. I mean, we got to fly out to L.A., and it was like, wow. I mean, it was really big showtime stuff. You know, they put you on the stage that, and now the zoo, and it's going to, and it turns around. We had, we had to have a, a song that lasted 100 seconds with no vocals. And so we were singing live, but everything else we were miming. Huh. It was really, it was, it was fun, and we we actually won. They won. And, Ca- and the Kansas City audience, the, the music community in Kansas City, was all on their TV sets that night watching the hometown guys. <laughs> Pretty fun. Well, I was, and when you won, you know, I was like, yeah. yeah. Like, Which had happened two guys. months before. Yeah. 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 Still, yeah. You, you know, you couldn't give it away. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So anyway, that was, that was kind of the zoo song. Yeah. And an addendum to that, um, we were on our way down to play a gig in Springfield or maybe going up to Omaha. And we, we actually traveled in a, in a school bus. We were stupid young kids. Um, and we stopped off at some little bitty, gas station walked in there and the people behind the counter recognized us. <laughs> it was big time stuff. So the thing that brings act one to an end for so many musicians is when you decide it's time to get married, buy a house, have some kids. And um, just jumping ahead in time a little bit, one time Jeff and I and Norm were playing at the record bar and I had gotten a message from Hootie and the Blowfish that they were going to be playing at Starlight, and I had been I had communicated with the guitar player Mark Bryan for for a number of years, and he said he was really going to try to make it down. He wanted to hear us play. Well, they got there when we were all done, and but we sat around and talked for you know a long time, and so Mark Bryan was talking about when Hootie. This is when Hootie and the Blowfish was still really they were doing great, and he talked about how you know when he wasn't playing with Hootie, he had another band, and when he wasn't playing with that band, he was producing some other band, and Jeff goes. I am so glad it's you and not me. <laughs> yeah, he said. <laughs> and he said. No, no, he said. He goes, well, I'm glad it's me too. Um, no, but he said, they were on their way. I said, so what are you doing tomorrow? He said, we're going to like, um, I don't know, Fort Wayne, Indiana. And I said, I'm so glad that's you and not me. Because I said, I'm glad it's me too. Yeah. yeah, yeah but, 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 but you know, yeah, I, I realized was there's a really clarifying moment yeah. to me. because I real, And I remember you saying to him, because I like to go home and just rap. My family yeah, and my home around Absolutely. me, that's where I am right now. Mm-hmm. And I, that, I remember that clear as, yeah. be, uh, as, a, a, as day because I realized you had made a decision. It's like, this is what is important to me. You know, music is really, really important, but this is really, really important. Yeah. And I am, I'm going to figure out my priorities here. So when you and I first made contact, uh, so now we're going to jump back in time just a little bit. Because Jeff and I had crossed paths, and that really, literally, we had only crossed paths. Uh, during the 80s and but before Jeff and I started playing music together I got a phone call from him one day and he goes Bob I got this band that some other band that has covered my music and I'm not sure I got the copyrights and the publishing and all of that in order what what should I do so Jeff and I had a, a conversation about how to how to protect that, well. you know how to how to make this song he is and get it copyrighted and all that stuff and uh, the band that was recording Jeff's song was the legendary Scatolites. Who are they going to be here like no, soon? They were just at the record bar a couple oh, of weeks they, ago. Oh, they were just, okay, uh, I knew legend, they were in town. Legendary, the people that basically invented ska music, and it was like 
it, it was like having Johnny Cash do one of my songs. It was that important for me. It was like it was huge. Yeah, and that and and I thought, well, that's really cool. Some internationally yeah. uh, renowned band yeah, is recording really this cool. guy's song. It was way cool. Yeah, it was very cool. I bet. You told me that's going to be like finding money in a bag. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and yeah, it was publishing money is like finding money on the street. So. Um, but then, and that's about where chapter, where act one became act two, because you decided, um, this is what's important to me. My wife, my, my kids that are coming, our home, and I'm going to, I'm going to be there. Yeah. And that's, that's a good decision yeah. to make. Yeah. Um, but you, but music was still, is that something you can't like surgically remove? You cannot. You know, it's, you it's part of you. So. Talk a little bit about what you were doing musically between the end of the zoo and you know beginning of married and family life, and before you and I started playing together. Um, what did you do in that time period? Um, the band SDI, like I say, was went away from the reggae and the R and B stuff and started doing um, soca music and other world beat stuff, which I really liked, but I could tell it, I felt like a fraud doing it. Um, and then for a while, I played, you know, um, my brother-in-law Norman, who will be up here later on tonight. Um, there was a church that was, um, the pastor was Van McLean's brother from Shooting Star, um, Mac. Um, and um, he said, y'all to come, we need a keyboard player in the band. So I was like, well, sure, man, you know, and you went and played on that for every Sunday for about four years. And, you know, and it was like one of these mega churches. You'd go up there and we'd play three services a day for six or 700 people. Um, and, and great musicians, Rod Lincoln, um, Kevin Rogers, Norm Daler, really, really good musicians. So that part of it was really, really fun. But, you know, the, the other philosophies that goes along with that, I, after a while, I just couldn't do. So I was sitting at home one night and not really, really wondering what I was to do. And the phone rang and it said, Bob Walkenhorst. And I picked up the phone. We, we, I'm jumping ahead here. No, it's okay. I, mean, I'm, and I picked up the phone and I said, we were getting ready to go out to dinner. I said, you are one of the few people that I would pick up the phone for right now. I thought you were calling me for a carpet question. <laughs> yeah, and, and so, and, and that began, that was a very, very important phone call for me to, to pick up because that actually, I mean, it like basically, uh, my musical world, world tilted on it that. It started night. chapter three. It Act did three. start chapter three. So the, the, the interesting thing about that moment in time is I hadn't played music anywhere for five years. I, I was married and children, and I was, you know, I was kind of making my own version of the same decisions about, okay, I've got to run all over the, the world. I've got to play all these shows. I've got to be on TV, and now this is starting, and I want to be here for this. And it was my version of the same thing that was yeah, happening yeah. to you. You wanted to be there for that. You didn't want to miss out on it. So I think that, and, and my wife, Michelle, when I, I was, I had recorded some songs and I was working uh, in video production somewhere and, and she said, you ought to call Jeff Porter. He was always a nice guy and a good player. And I said, really? Yeah. Never, never, he never crossed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's kind of how that came to be. She yeah. said, you ought to give, she said, if you're looking yeah. for people, new people to play with, you ought to, you ought to give Jeff Porter Thank a call. You, Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, so Thank you, so Michelle. I did. And, yeah. and, uh, Luckily, Norm was kind of in the same position, family-wise, career-wise, and in that you know he had his priorities and had children, and it's like, okay, if we all are on the same page here, maybe we can put together a good musical project that does not compromise our lives. No one has aspirations of taking this out on the road, yeah. and that was kind of the beginning of, of Act Three for you, where the record bar and uh, the the music community that started forming around the record bar, which is most of you people. You guys. Uh, started becoming a really important part of our life. So, uh, we got reverb. Somehow, somehow reverb just happened here. We don't want the reverb. Hello. <laughs> people of the planet Earth. Did you get a Mr. Microphone? There we go. I don't know what it is. There we go. Okay, it's gone now. Okay. Buzz is just trying to throw us off. I man. know. I know. I know. I um, know. Where were so we? So backing up to that phone call. Yeah. So the legendary rock star, Bob Walkenhorst, calls Jeff Porter <laughs> and, uh, and says, man, do you want to play music with me? And Jeff's response was, I'll have to think about it. <laughs> Which I think is a beautiful thing. It's like, Jeff knew me. You know, we, we knew each other. We knew each other were serious about music pretty good at what we did, 
But he had to pause and think about it. And I thought that was like spoke very well. Well, you. thank like, you. I need to think about I've, this. I've, I've I need to think about this. Shooting from the hip. I was like, yeah, man, I, I don't know, man. Yeah, you know? life's busy. Your life's busy right now. Yeah. And then Jeff says to me, once we decided, yeah, okay, let's let's figure out. I said, well, I've, I've got these songs I've recorded, and I, I want to go out and play them for people, and I, I need people to play them with. And would you would you consider doing this? He's like, okay, yeah. And I sent him the songs. And he goes, do you know my brother-in-law? Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh yeah, Norm. Yeah. Well, you said you said you, we need. You said I've been. Do you know a, a bass player? And you mentioned some others, and I was like, Yeah, I never really liked that guy. <laughs> um, and then I said, You ought to call my brother-in-law Norm. And Norm was. I was kind of in the same relationship with yeah. Norm. We had literally just crossed paths. Yeah. I'll tell you one of my best memories of Norm before I knew knew him was that a a friend that we had in common in their basement. Uh, you know, a bunch of single guys <laughs> living together, That's and Norm was there for some reason. Anyway, this guy was a this guy was was pumped, and he had like a gym in his basement. And so I go down to the basement. Norm, for some reason, was there too, and he's laying on a weight bench, lift lifting weights with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one. I love that. Yeah. So, so Jeff calls Norm and says, well, Bob wants to play music. Yeah, let's get together and talk about it. So Norm shows up at the first rehearsal quite a, way, quite a time, quite a much earlier than Jeff. And Norm and I sit there very uncomfortably and kind of looked at each other and like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, where do we start here? And it's, it's really funny. It's like being on a date because being in a band with somebody, whether it's a full-time band that's touring or whether it's people that you are going to play music with once a week, it becomes an intimate relationship really fast. Um, you are sharing a part of yourself. You're combining parts of yourself that are uh, the most internal parts, the parts of you that, that want to create something pure and beautiful. And then you want to share it with a whole bunch of people you sort of know. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an adventure. But I, that, those first times of rehearsing with you and Norm are some of my favorite memories of playing music because I think we were all at that point where we hadn't really played a lot for a while and we were getting to do it again and you were kind of like, oh, I remember. I yeah, remember was, how it, good it, this It was is. wonderful. It really was wonderful. And, and I had never played music, even though Norm had been a member of my family for 10 or 12 years at that point, I'd never played music with him. You know, I mean, not even picking up a guitar and strumming it at Christmas or anything like that that I can recall. And it's like, oh, and so, um, yeah, way to go, Normie. Okay, so I'm going to try to kind of like fast forward here because this is lasting way more well, than 20 I knew minutes. It would be. They're going to run out <laughs> of battery. They're going to edit, yeah. Right. Um, so Jeff and I played for a while uh, and with Norm, and you know we, we played the record bar, and then we would get you know occasional gigs here and there. Norm was busy with the elders, so we knew that if there was ever an elders gig, well then we were a duo, <laughs> yeah. because the bass the bass player would be elsewhere. Uh, but we played, and it was working, you know, and our, our little crowd at the, at the record bar kept getting bigger, and we enjoyed that. And then Jeff says, Bob, I've got a bunch of songs that I've written, and I, I'm going to try to go to a studio and, and record them. Um, got any advice where I should go? And I said, well, Jeff, I know how to do this yeah, stuff. I, I, so I, let's talk about your first yeah, solo album. Yeah, you said you need to make this with me. Um, Bob was working at um, uh, a video production facility that also had, you know, Recording had moved from um, two-inch tape, you know, um, to um, to um, digital the Pro Tools, where it was just like, okay, wow, man, it, okay, go, go again. You know, you didn't have to wait for the tape to rewind, and and Bob knew how to to do that stuff. So we started every I think on Monday night, we would go over and Bob would ride his scooter to the to the studio, and I would bring a, a bottle of scotch and we'd sit there and we would start recording these songs. Um, and I had never, I mean, I'd recorded before, but never really my own songs that I really didn't know how they would go, um, and just the experiment. And we ended up making, you know, a, a really nice record that was kind of all over the board stylistically, um, but it's held up well. And I think you're, I think the nice thing about that first solo record of yours is that all these songs, stylistically, yes, it reflected all the musical experiences you had had. But your personality and your vision of the world really shone through. It's like, and I think for oh, you, it was kind of a you. well. But I think it was thank kind of a revelation you. to you it when was. you kind of heard it all together. It's yeah. like, oh, this is what I have to say. Yeah, yeah. And it's and it's, it's kind of I I rarely I haven't listened to that record for a long time. I, mean, I don't know how other artists are, but I don't listen to a lot of my own yeah. stuff. Occasionally, I'll listen to it. You've heard it enough. I've heard it enough. Um, but yeah, I and I think back and every once in a while I'll hear one of those and I'm like, well, 
That's pretty damn good. Yeah. Yeah. Way to way to go, forty five year old Jeff. <laughs> yeah. So Jeff, Jeff made we made Jeff's solo record, and it was really a pleasure to do that. We had so much fun Thank because you. because we weren't we didn't have aspirations. Do you remember or, my payment? Uh, bottle of scotch. Oh no, you gave me. <laughs> I had always admired this ruler that was in Jeff's house. It Bob's was dad great, was a carpenter. First of all, this great big know. long ruler. It's like five and a half feet long. And I always said, man, that's a great piece. It was old. I don't know what that the was, story was. Ancient. I found it in an apartment. And so at the end of the recordings, when we got it all done, Jeff gave me that ruler. <laughs> and it's an, and it was an antique, it on the back. antique, and it had pennies on the, on the uh, tape to the backside. Yeah. And, and Bob said, he goes, that's because when these draftsmen would use this, they would keep, the pennies would keep it off of the draft. And I said, well, thank you. You've solved the mystery of yeah, the yeah, pennies yeah, on the back yeah. of this. So, yeah. okay. so, so Jeff makes his solo record, and we keep playing at the record bar. Our crowd keeps gro- growing. We, you know, we played so many Rainmaker songs. We played so many uh, cover songs that we had never played before. We never rehearsed. And then we started working in Jeff's originals. And so what started out as kind of Bob's lead vocal project is kind of like, oh, now, now it's got a little more of a two, a two vocalist uh, thing. And, uh, and it was really, really fun. And it always was really fun. Oh, yes. So Jeff and I decide, well, this is going well. Let's make a record together. So we make a record called No Abandon. The... The funny thing was Jeff had just, you know, called out all of his songs of what would be the best songs for his solo record, and then we're ready to make another record. Yeah. Uh, but Jeff, um, <clears throat> Jeff brought it. He brought some of his very best songs to our, our No Abandon record, and I got to, you know, use songs that I had accumulated for a few years. And th- so making the record, we decide, well, well, what should we do? Well, we're playing a few gigs. Jeff, we ought to go to Norway and Go play. to Norway. <laughs> I said, I think I can get us some gigs in I'm Norway. I'm down. Let's go to Norway. So Jeff and I took No, no Abandon and our two, two acoustic guitars. And uh, <laughs> so our first trip to Norway, I haven't, been in, I haven't been in a decade. Jeff hasn't been before. We go out to KCI, and we're getting ready to get on the plane. And, <laughs> and we decide we'll have a beer. We, we got there plenty early. We're going to have a beer. So we're having a beer, and it's like, Last call for flight number like 452. Jeff, that's our plane. So we almost missed the plane. So uh, our, we land in Nashville, which, which we, I thought, that's great. Our connection is going to be, in, or, or I mean Memphis. Our connection is going to be in Memphis. How, how more legendary can that be? So we decided to do the same thing in Memphis. We're going to get a beer, and we're sitting there enjoying our beer, and it's like, last call for flight number Jeff, Jeff. So we go to Norway, and Jeff and I have a great time in Norway, but our very first show is in Oslo, big crowd. And we play a couple of our, our No Abandon songs. And then I play a Rainmaker song. We played, um, do you remember what it was? When They Got Away. When They Got Away. And, and, and the entire, well, first of all, when we walked out on stage, everyone started singing The Rainmaker Came to Town, which I had not heard before. And I'm like, what is this, What are they man? saying? And this is, in a, this is in a big club, you know, 350, 400 people. I mean, with people right up here. I'm like, what is the, the Rainmaker Came to Town? What's that? Um, and, and then because so Jeff didn't listen to the rain. Well, well I, I knew your hits, and, and then so and we Hit. played we, singular. Yeah, singular. right. And then and then we played um, No Abandon. It was great, and uh, and then we started playing um, the one that got away, and the whole um, crowd starts singing along with it before we even started we the start vocals. Singing, yeah. They're like the crowd just took it. Yeah, yeah. And I was, and I had forgotten that, and I was like Jeff. Look at this. Look at this. I, Rain- I'd forgotten this. So Norway the, loves us. So the next year, the Rainmakers reformed. And um, first call was to our bass player, Rich Ruth, and said, do Rich, you want to do this? Rich said, yep, Rich is on board. Pat Tomic was on board. Asked Steve Phillips, and Steve's like, I, the elders are, are really, really cooking right now. And I said, I understand. Jeff already knew the songs. It's like, where can I find a guitar player? <laughs> Yeah. So Jeff, so Jeff's uh, next act started uh, of Jeff's years in the Rainmakers. Yeah. Well, I had never been a hot shot. Well, I'm still not a hot shot rock and roll player, but I had never had to be a rock and roll um, lead guitarist. Um, so I had a lot to learn there. I mean, I knew how to play and I knew how to improvise. Um, there was the whole thing about um, guitar tone. By the way, this guy over here has the best guitar tone of any human being I've ever known, Jimmy Nace. He does. I mean, and so much, so much of being a rock and roll guitar player is guitar tone. I mean, if you go out there with this little bitty, it won't work. And um, so I had to learn how to do that. Luckily, um, solos for the Rainmakers are only 8 to 16 bars long. Because I'm not going to improvise for a long time. I, you, know, I, you know, ladies, I can give you 8 good bars. <laughs> 
and then I'm kind of done. Um, <laughs> Um, so, uh, so I learned how to do that, and then Bob and Rich, and to a degree, Stian said, "You know, man, look here. You know, you gotta own it, and you gotta." And so I learned how to be like, go out on stage and be cocky, and be, you know, kind of be a rock star. Because I can't overemphasize how big the rainmakers are in Norway. I mean, it's like, it's like I remember when we the first time we played the rainmakers played at um, John D, which is not the biggest venue in Oslo, but certainly right up there. You know, it holds, what, 2,000 people? Mm -hmm. And we're coming back from dinner in the, in the travel van, and there's, you know, we're just going, all this, and there's, there's, and we're a good five minutes from the club, and there's people lined up on the street. And I'm finally said, what the hell is going on? And I don't know if it's either you or Steon. Somebody said, uh, Jeff, the Rainmakers are playing tonight. And I was, like, <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, well, things just got real. And Pat said, oh, if you're going you're gonna to be a rock star tonight, then... He was right. But I think the, the, the common thread here between your early days, um, the, the, duo, the duo, the trio's early days, is when you really don't have any expectations, yeah. often the best things happen. Yeah. Uh, so we recorded an album to go, to go back to Norburn, and, and Jeff's contributions, Norway. musical... You said Norburn. Where did I say you said Norburn. Norburn. I mean, we did I'm, go back to Norburn, Norburn, by the way. I got the first syllable right. Um, so good to go to Norway. I was in Norburn two days ago, actually. <laughs> So, and uh, Jeff's contributions on that record are, are stunning. And I, again, it's one of those things where the, com the combination of personalities, newness, getting to do something you thought you may not ever get to do again. Yeah. It was kind of like getting a reprieve. But Jeff is still writing songs. Jeff is still, you know, Jeff is still, he's, fine. he's found himself as a solo artist. He knows what he wants to do. So it's time for Jeff to make another solo record. And... He didn't ask me. I don't know. I bet. No. You got, so talk about your second. No, well, I'm you, I was joking. You, you talk, know, I didn't. Talk, uh, yeah. Tell us about your um, second solo record. You were busy with something. Oh, yeah, I was. You, you, were, you had grandkids that were your kids, kind of, I think yeah. is what it was. Um, so, I, so Pat Tomic, uh, Rainmaker's drummer. Well, I wasn't working at the recording studio anymore either. That's so. right. That's true. So I needed a place to make it, and, and Pat was the obvious thing. And so we made another one, and it, it, you know, it, it came out good. Mark Schaffner, who had been the first... Um, Rainmaker's um, live sound man before Buzz um, helped mix it and um, you know Norm helped on it Key and Byrne of the Elders you know the, we helped it and you know we made it and there are a couple of really really good tracks on it and I thought wow I can go back and tour Nor I can tour Norway solo on this I realized that I'd made enough by this time the Rainmakers had been over to Norway I'd been over uh, with maybe five or six times and I because we, we had played we were playing Cross It Remember that, that super crazy gig where the la lady had her hair set on fire? Yeah. Um, it, really, it's rock and roll. Um, and I knew that I was coming back, that was like in June, and I was coming back in September, and that was, that was 2016. And I thought, well, okay, I'm going to come um, solo tour. And I booked my own tour. I called people I knew, and I did it myself. And it, it was a lot of fun. So just talk about a little bit what it's like um, since you had always played in bands and now you're going to make the decision to go play solo mm. for crowds and whether it's American or Norway or Norburn for that matter. Uh, going out solo in front of a crowd is a, is a tightrope walk. Well, so, right. so talk a little bit about your first experiences of doing that in Norway. Um, well, it, it's, there's kind of like having to be the hotshot rock and roll guitar player you haven't done it before, um, and people are just right here, and you're in small venues, uh, uh, house concerts, and there, you know, when you're playing in a rock band, it's like you will listen to us because we are loud, and there are lights, and you know, it's it's a big show. And when you're doing a, a solo stuff, it's like people are right here, and you have nowhere to hide, and it's um, it's more work in a way, I think, when you're doing solo. Yeah. Oh, what we got. Wrap it up. Okay. okay right. <laughs> See, we knew that we were just going to talk too yeah. long. And, and that's actually fine, because that was actually where I am in, into your okay. current act. Um, you and I and Norm stopped playing together in 20, about 2018 because I was starting to play music with my daughter, and life was moving on in different directions. And, uh, but you and Norm kept playing, and then you, did, you needed, you, I guess you just... Tell us how you decided, how you ended up with the Nace Brothers as your band. And that is very, uh, well, your they're, friends, they're, they're my friend's band. Uh, um, band I, I, I refuse to be, call it the Jeff Porter band because it's not. Um, that was like an accidental thing. We should probably be called the accidental band. Um, you know, Norm and I were down at the uh, 
um, the new record bar, a fabulous venue, and Steve Tulipana and Sean Cheryl are great guys, but it was obvious that you know the community that had grown up around the Wednesday night thing, the record downtown record bar was not where it should be. It was just the parking was a pardon me, the parking was a pain in the butt and so I went around one night, I remember asking Loretta, I remember asking Audrey, I said, would you guys want to move this down to Mike Kelly's West Sider? And they said, yes. <laughs> so Norm and I moved down there, and shortly after that, the elders were playing a thing with the Nace brothers. And Norm said, hey, man, Dave Nace is going to bring his cojones sit in with us. And I'm like, cool. Um, and I'd, never, I'd known Dave kind of, you know, from playing, you know, like, you know, other musicians. And, and he started playing, it was like, oh, well, this is great, man. He's a soulful dude, he's gonna you know, be singing harmony great together. And then we did that for two weeks, and he said, hey, man, my brother Jimmy is in town, and I'm gonna have him come and, and play. But I think Jimmy, first time, Norm wasn't there, and, and Jimmy played the bass, right? Oh, Jimmy's a, great, Jimmy's a great musician. Anyway, so slowly this band develops, and when Jimmy started playing guitar, about two weeks into it, I remember we finished the song, and Jimmy said, this band? And it was just something really, really obvious and magical. I know that's kind of a hackneyed word, but it really was. And I was like, these guys are great, and they're soulful, and we all get along. And so it was like, I've got a bunch of songs. Let's record a record together. And instead of going in and recording it where I was playing everything and finding other guys to fill it in, it was just like, here's these songs, guys. How do you feel them? How do you play them? And they did, and they knew exactly, and it was, it's really cool. And I've got some of these LPs here for anybody that has a turntable. Come up and talk to me. I mean, you know, if you, if you paid to get in here, I will give you one. It's a great LP. Thank you, Jimmy and Dave and Norm, for that. Okay, so that kind of brings us up to the present. And those guys are actually here to play music yeah. with Jeff, but you're going to play some solo stuff I, first. I'm going to play one song because I would really like to get it on, on um, um, tape or whatever this is. Are we okay, um, Adam? Are we okay on as far as time wise goes? Um, hey, my. My hero and my mentor, Bob Walkenhorst. Right here. I love you. I love you, love you too. All right, thanks for listening to Jeff and I go on like old men on a park bench. Well, you know. And we'll do it again. Hey, sometime. you know, my knee's been bothering me. I've been trying some of this DMSO stuff on it. You can't get it. You only get it online.